lately I've been pondering the question of whether the general stigma against prog rock in certain kind of social circles or in the critical establishment has either receded or maybe even ended totally. And I, I do get that that's a question that's probably not going to be of much interest to some people, right? Um, it's easy to kind of just dismiss it all as, well, who cares what they think anyway? And sure, you know, that's that's fine. But it is a question that's of interest to me just because, you know, I, I went to college in the Seattle area in the early 2000s, and I had a lot of interactions where, you know, you go to a party or, or you're you're talking to somebody on campus and you start talking about favorite bands and you mention, you know, King Crimson or Yes or Genesis, God forbid, Genesis. And there is, uh, there's an immediate dismissive snotty response that you would get from people, right? And... Presumably that's based on them having read, you know, Spin or Rolling Stone or Pitchfork and having some sense from the uh, the general assumptions of the music critical establishment that those were things that you were supposed to smugly dismiss, right? And maybe that shouldn't have mattered to me, but it did, you know? I mean, music was a very key part of my identity in those days. I mean, it still is now, but I'm probably um, a little healthier about it, you know? Um, but that dynamic alienated me from a lot of the people that I was around in that time. And the perception of hostility toward what I liked also put me off of a lot of things that I saw as hipster bands, right? Stuff like the Velvet Underground or Sonic Youth or newer things that were newer than like Pinback or Mew, who actually had kind of methods and styles and goals that were, that overlapped somewhat with progressive rock, but that I tended to dismiss in kind of a defensive way, right? Because I, I associated them with people who were uh, who were condescending dicks about things that I loved. And again, you know, this habit was based in in a message that people were getting from what used to be the sort of music critical establishment, right? And that's something that's of interest to a pretty small number of people, but circumstantially I was around those people a lot in those days. Uh, the most recent example I can think of of that kind of attitude is, you know, back in 2017, the, uh, the political reporter Dave Weigel um, wrote a book about the history of progressive rock. And when that book came out, there was an article in The Atlantic saying basically like, no, let's not reappraise this stuff. It was all awful. That opinion does not need to be changed. Um, on the topic of Weigel, I remember he he published a series on prog rock for the, the web magazine, the primarily political web magazine Slate. And, you know, there are headlines there that suggest, for instance, that Emerson, Lake, and Palmer are regarded as a joke, which is something that I don't think would be taken as a, a, a default assumption now. I don't think it's something that would be said so casually in this context, actually, by someone who likes that music. Now, as far as the, the things that made me think that this consensus was changing or receding, uh, I think the Genesis tour that just wrapped up yesterday as of this filming is probably a pretty big, uh, a big catalyst for that, uh, or kind of a watershed, right? If you're watching this video, you probably remember the article that Jalissa Castrodale published in Vice, arguing that Genesis were always a great band. And 10 years ago, I cannot imagine that outlet publishing something like that. I, the The idea of it wouldn't, nobody would ever propose that as a topic to the editors of that outlet. It was also really interesting to me last year to see a retro review on Pitchfork of the album Duke, uh, which gave it an 8.0. And um, in that review, actually, they also mention in passing that Duke isn't even as good as the classic prog stuff, which suggests if you read between the lines, right, or behind the lines, uh -huh, that there are multiple Genesis albums that would rate higher than an 8.0 on Pitchfork. And, man, 
20 years ago, Pitchfork for me was the, the cultural epicenter of people who made me feel like shit for liking Van de Graaff Generator more than Modest Mouse. Outside the realm of institutional music hipsterdom, you know, I, I keep seeing all these mainstream rock artists kind of casually name-checking prog rock. You know, a, a friend sent me this photo of Rob Zombie in a Jethro Tull t-shirt. Uh, there was something a, a couple weeks before Taylor Hawkins died, actually, Taylor Hawkins of the Foo Fighters. There was a headline that I saw go around of him saying on Howard Stern that uh, King Crimson should be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Nick Cave has name-checked Robert Fripp and David Gilmour as his favorite guitarists. And, you know, I know that these are not people who are at the epicenter of the culture at this point, but 10 years ago, 20 years ago, the idea of the members of the Foo Fighters going on Howard Stern and praising King Crimson would have been unthinkable. So where did this kind of institutional disdain for prog rock come from? Uh, to my understanding, it's basically a consequence of the whole culture of music journalism in outlets like Rolling Stone and Spin and Pitchfork and, and the various kind of people that followed that aesthetic uh, or other outlets that kind of were trying to be part of that. Uh, the, the sort of the cultural touchstones, the cultural standpoint of that, for whatever reason, calcified in about 1978, right? Even decades after the Sex Pistols broke up, it was all rooted in a fundamentally post-punk viewpoint. And for whatever reason, that, that whole set of assumptions managed to really take root and dominate for maybe 30 years after that, give or take. So what's changed recently? Well, you know, like any of it, I suppose some amount of it is just generational, right? A certain set of people have aged out, another set of people have come in. Uh, Castrodale is, is my age, right? And I'm not that young. But I'm a lot younger than the people who were running the major music outlets in the 80s and 90s and early 2000s. And there's an awful lot that's been said about the death of the monoculture, right? The way that everybody has been allowed to put themselves into their own little cultural silos. And uh, one effect that that's had is that there isn't really a predominant cultural orthodoxy anymore. Spin and Rolling Stone and Pitchfork and all those other things like that aren't significant. They're not dominant in the way that they used to be. Um, they're not enormously relevant the way that they used to be. And there are a lot of small conversations happening. And this just generally, I think that effect reduces the extent to which there is any default way of thinking or any, um, any set group of assumptions that everybody's supposed to have at least in terms of relatively insignificant things, like whether or not one should assume that Emerson, Lake, and Palmer is a joke. I've heard some references in the last few years to the term poptimism, right? Meaning a movement toward the serious critical appraisal of pop music, of things that would have been dismissed as fluff 10 years ago or 15 or 20 years ago. And you would not think that that would benefit prog rock, but I think what's happened is... You know, that that narrow change is tied to a general movement away from ways of thinking about culture, which involve the wholesale dismissal of entire movements or styles. And usually that's framed as uh, it's framed as having to do with shifts in the dominant narratives around things like race or sexual identity. Um, but I think maybe it's had a side benefit to Prague, even if the Atlantic says that it's the widest music ever. And I think maybe one side effect of the disappearance of the monoculture that doesn't get discussed as much is people don't spend as much time disliking music. If for no other reason than there are certain shifts that have made us less likely to have to spend time listening to music that we don't like, particularly those of us who are, um, who are adults. While there is a lot of negativity on the internet, obviously, much less of it seems to be centered around uh, just generally 
disliking things that uh, disliking music that that people find distasteful for whatever reason. Um, so you know the the general movement away from a set of shared cultural assumptions, plus uh, the general movement away from kind of making a sport of you know bashing music that you dislike. Maybe that's been replaced by other forms of negativity. Uh, but it has, if nothing else, resulted in, like I mentioned earlier, um, the reduction of a shared set of assumptions that everybody has to hate prog rock. Now, you know, is this the most important thing in the world? Perhaps not. Perhaps not even for people who like this kind of music, you know. Ultimately, it's probably a pretty minor thing, but... Uh, you know, the phenomenon that I'm talking about did cause me a decent amount of grief when I was in my early 20s, and uh, it's, it's encouraging to me now to think that perhaps it's something that won't be an issue for people that age who have the same set of tastes and interests that I did. Anyway, let me know if this matches your observations and what you think the reason for it might be. As always, check out Electric Brain, Electric Shadow on Bandcamp or your favorite streaming platform. And I'll see everybody hopefully next week.